being here and for all he's done to, to support our efforts. Yeah. Senator Gruders, and then we have Representatives Robinson, Gregory, and Representative Wenge Newton. Thank you guys for, for what you're doing. Thank you for coming here. Uh, uh, yesterday, the state of Florida reported uh, the most number of, of test results uh, since we've started this. We got 23,884 test results. Uh, out of that massive batch, it only yielded 589 new Florida cases. And so if you look at the percent positive, which is something we track very closely, uh, yesterday's test results have got to be the lowest percent positive uh, since we've been doing any type of major testing, but it was about 2.61% of all the new tests that came in were positive. So that puts us at a 97 plus percent negative rate. You look at other parts of the country, you have some places where they're still 30, 40, some are even close to 50% of all the tests are coming back positive. So here in Florida, we've seen that trend go down. I don't think we've been above uh, six, low six percent in probably about two weeks. And I think that uh, we've not we've not reached seven in probably quite some time. So I think that that's a good trend. Uh, but part of that is because we have worked so hard to expand testing. So this is here at the Sarasota University Town Center is the 12th state supported drive through testing site that we have throughout the state of Florida. As we go into phase one, it's important that people, they're going to work, they have an opportunity to get testing. And I know there's people have done a great job, hospitals, doctors, offices, there have been a lot of great things done with testing, but we feel just having a baseline of state support in various regions of the state is very important. Um, it's interesting, I wonder whether people will say as Florida launches into phase run, percentage positive tests plunge to record low. I don't think they will write that headline uh, because it's not going to generate the type of clicks. But the fact of the matter is uh, Florida has, has met all the gating criteria to be in the phase one. Obviously, we're doing it very judiciously, uh, putting the southeast Florida counties on a little bit different timetable. Uh, but certainly, I think on the west coast of Florida, uh, we have the ability uh, to move into phase one and then, and then I think uh, hopefully continue down the line. So, so this is important. We are earmarking 400 tests a day through here. But if there's more demand, we can do more. What we've noticed throughout the state is these test sites tend to have more capacity than there is demand. So you have different places that have similar populations to Sarasota Manatee, maybe like a Duval County, and they're typically doing about 200 tests a day that go through those. This can accommodate uh, 400, but if we need to scale it up, that will happen very quickly. And I know Jared has supplies ready to go to get ready to go. So so far uh, throughout the pandemic, just our drive-through sites have done 109,000 tests, the ones that the state has supported. There have been other drive-through sites that healthcare systems have set up, and of course they've done an awful lot as well. Uh, but this has been a real key component uh, to us fighting the, the pandemic here in the state of Florida. Beyond the drive-through sites, we are continuing to pioneer walk-up testing locations. Uh, so this takes testing locations, uh, particularly into underserved communities, and gives folks uh, the opportunity to come get tested. Some folks, not everyone has a car. Uh, not everyone has the ability to get to some of these test sites. So just those 10 walk-up sites, we've been doing these for probably about three weeks now, and we've done over 10,000 tests. Tomorrow, uh, Director Moskowitz and I are going to announce the first, I think the first of its kind, mobile testing lab, where we're gonna have an RV outfitted with a lab inside, and we're going to be doing the 45 minute rapid test. So we'll be able to take those to places such as long-term care facilities, test, and we are doing that now, but get results back immediately or close to immediately, uh, which is very exciting. So we're gonna unveil that tomorrow. Uh, the company that provides the rapid test said, they're not aware of anyone in the United States doing the mobile lab like they're doing now. They actually do this because Cephia does the HIV test. So there's places in Africa where they will go around and do it. Uh, they haven't seen it yet. So they're, the company's excited as well. And we're very excited to be able to, to announce that tomorrow. We have 50 teams of National Guardsmen that have been going proactively into our long-term care facilities to be able uh, to try to identify clusters of infections with particularly asymptomatic staff. 
the very beginning of this, we had very stringent restrictions, didn't allow visitors into the long-term care facility, and had a lot of screening that had to be done for each staff member. The problem is you don't always show symptoms when you're infected. And so you can do the temperature check and all that. It's important and it does help, but it's not enough. And so we started to see cases in long-term care facilities where no one knew the staff member was sick and you have it would spread like wildfire amongst the staff. So they've gone in proactively and test. I've, they've identified some clusters and have isolated those and prevented many more infections, which is very, very important. We also are going to have more convenient testing with some of the private businesses. Walgreens is setting up nine drive through sites throughout Florida. There's going to be one in Hillsborough County, but they may end up doing more. CVS is going to do some. Walmart is going to open up drive through sites in partnership with Quest Diagnostics. And so if you think back to February, there were not even really tests available. The CDC was the only one that had them. And really the criteria was you had to have certain symptoms, you had to be a certain age, and you had to have some connection with travel to China. Well, that is much different picture now. The, for you want to come to this test site, obviously if you have coronavirus symptoms, come. It doesn't matter how old. Uh, two, if you're a healthcare worker, first responder, regardless of symptoms, come get tested. And then even if you're somebody that's totally asymptomatic but believe that you may have been exposed to coronavirus in one way or another, come. We want to definitely, I think if you look at the numbers in Sarasota Manatee, uh, there's not been as many younger people that have tested than in some other parts of the, of the state. So this gives an opportunity for folks that either have symptoms, work in healthcare, or may just think that they were in contact with someone. So we think that that's a good thing. We're also going to be announcing this week the deployment of antibody tests at our drive-through testing facilities. So the antibody tests test whether your body has developed antibodies, which means that you have had the disease in the past. And because so many of the cases we're starting to learn, or we've actually probably figured this for, for, for many weeks, the vast majority of cases appear to be either asymptomatic or the symptoms seem to be so minor that you wouldn't even necessarily think to go get medical attention. You look at some of the antibody academic tests, research projects that have been done at Stanford in um, Santa Clara County, Miami-Dade, University of Miami did one, LA County, New York uh, City and state have done them. What they're finding is the number of documented cases is one thing, the number of people with the antibodies is far, far in excess of the number of people who have actually tested positive with a diagnostic test. So that's important to know. If you're a healthcare worker and you have the antibodies, then obviously you have immunity. We don't know how long that immunity is. Some people think six months, two years. I think eventually we'll find out. Uh, but certainly that's important. If you work in a long-term care facility and you have antibodies, that's important to know. And then also just people I've had people say, you know, I had a really nasty illness in or late February. I went in, tested for flu, was negative. I may have had this. Well, you come in, if you have the antibodies, then you'll know. Usually the antibodies take about two weeks uh, to develop. It, it's not something that would happen overnight. So certainly if you were infected anytime February, March, early April, we would expect the antibodies to show. So we have already received 200,000 antibody tests for serological testing. We've done a survey of all the hospitals that may need some, so we're going to send them to any hospital that wants it. Clearly it's important for the doctors and the nurses, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to have lanes dedicated to antibody testing at our drive through sites, and so people will be able to come by and get through that. We're also going to likely do our own state of Florida study where we can try to determine the prevalence in different parts of the state. As you look at the numbers, we have uh, almost 40% of the cases are in one county, Miami-Dade County. And then if you look at Southeast Florida, they comprise 60% of the cases and similar percentages for hospitalizations and fatalities. So the prevalence there may be a little bit different than some other parts of the state, but it's important for us to know. So antibody testing is finally here from, from the state. We're, we're going to get many more coming down the line, but this 200,000 I think will be a really good start. It's also important to, to look and, and understand uh, who is the most at risk from the coronavirus. In the state of Florida, those who are 85 and older represent 
of the documented positive cases in the state of Florida, but 30% of the fatalities in the state of Florida. People that are between 75 and 84 represent 8% of the positive test results in the state of Florida, but 30% of the fatalities. So you're looking at 60% of the fatalities in the state of Florida are folks who are 75 and up. Most of those folks had one or more comorbidity. And so we understand who the most vulnerable groups are, the coronavirus. We also understand the people, if you're 50 and under with no conditions, uh, you're at low risk, uh, and that, that's a good thing to know. But it does require us to continue to do all that we've done um, and, and really make it even stronger uh, for uh, supporting our long-term care facilities. We did a lot at the very beginning. CMS uh, used Florida's model as, a, as its guidance that it pushed out to the other states. Uh, Jared has been great. One of the things we knew was we needed the folks in the long-term care facilities to wear the PPE, mask and other things to prevent, uh, help cut down on infection. But we had to put our money where our mouth is. So Jared, pretty soon, uh, Department of Emergency Management, we will have sent out 10 million masks to just long-term care facilities. I think where Jared has the exact numbers, but uh, we've sent out seven, eight million for sure, and we have many more on the way. Uh, we've also done over a million gloves, half a million face shields. When I presented that at the White House and showed what we've done, FEMA has now responded by doing something similar where they're sending PPE directly to the long-term care facility. So Florida long-term care facilities are gonna get what the state sent. They're also gonna get things that FEMA is sending. So that's gonna be a pretty important stockpile uh, to be able to have. But we also understood that you needed to have the expeditionary testing. So you, you have that with the National Guard. RRV mobile testing lab will be focused on this most vulnerable group in our society. And so we think that that's gonna be a major force multiplier. But we also, and Florida hospitals have worked very well with, with our ACA agency, Secretary Mary Mayhew, as well as the Florida Department of Health on not sending COVID positive patients back into nursing homes that can't accept them. Other states, that was their policy. Um, that has not been a good standard of practice. And so what you've seen, places like the Cleveland Clinic, I was at Halifax and Daytona, they understand the risk that comes with that. So what they're, what they're doing, I think pretty common practice in Florida has been, uh, if somebody comes in and they're COVID positive, you don't send them back to the nursing home until they've had two negative tests. But we also understand that there could be people that go in from nursing homes to seek medical attention who not for COVID, and, but you don't know whether they, can, they have it or maybe they develop it. So even if you're not having COVID, uh, we are now requiring a negative test to be discharged and sent back to the nursing home. As part of my order into phase one, where we turned on the elective procedures, we wanted hospitals, what they have to do is assure us that there's gonna be hospital space in the event of a COVID hospitalization spike, that they have adequate PPE. And then the third most, I think, important factor is, and most of this is just a continuation of common of current practice, but working with both the state and the localities on making sure that the long-term care facilities and nursing homes have adequate support. So we are actually doing a, a, an actual emergency rule uh, that was issued yesterday. Any individual discharged to a long-term care facility uh, does need a test, a negative test, regardless of symptoms, regardless of whether they even went in for COVID-19. And I think that will help because you send an asymptomatic senior back uh, that can really spread inside one of those long-term care facilities. Uh, we're also formalizing some of the transfer guidance that ACA has been giving uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, basically, um, we are uh, requiring uh, long-term care facilities to transfer residents that test positive for COVID-19 if the facility is not properly equipped to isolate and care for the patients. We do have some facilities that have isolation, negative pressure rooms, where you could care for a COVID patient. Many of them do not have that. And so if they do not have that, 
you don't have a way to keep this from spreading, and so we need that them to be transferred to a safe environment. And I think that that's really, really helpful. County health departments will be help assisting the facilities with the implement, implementation of the transfer directive. Again, a lot of folks, th this is kind of how the practice has been going. We think it's important to formalize it. We're not trying to be punitive. We just want to make sure that, um, that we're not doing anything that would exacerbate the problems uh, that we already have. Uh, the reality, though, is is that um, the many of these um, uh, CDC infection control standards exceed typical expectations uh, with these facilities, especially related to isolation. So that's just the reality, and we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can. We also, though, understand that we need to incentivize uh, hospitals to want to continue doing this. If you look. You actually get, if you keep them in a long-term care facility, you can potentially get more money from the long-term care facility from Medicare. And you know, we think that that's problematic. Uh, so I wrote to SEMA Verma requesting that CMS provide hospitals reimbursement for Kate, per patients with COVID-19 that may not otherwise meet hospital admitting criteria. It's flexibility that we're looking for on the reimbursement will make it easier for hospitals to take transfers from nursing homes and assisted living facilities to keep patients that are COVID positive um, from having to return to a nursing home or assisted living facility. We think that's where the administration is going on this uh, because I think they understand uh, that this makes it safe for, for the other residents and right now, the hospitals throughout this whole pandemic, we've had 40, 45 percent of all beds have been empty in the state of Florida. You'll start to see that change because we have the elective surgeries turned on. So people are going to start going in. You will have inpatient surgeries. I think also people were really scared about going into the hospital for other ailments. We've tried to stress focus on the facts. Don't focus on fear. Uh, hospitals are safe. You have chest pain, stroke symptoms. Do not just wait that out uh, because that can really exacerbate your situation. And so we think people are, are, are doing that. I think you're starting to see more people seeking medical care, but certainly we want to do that. So, so I think that is going to be a, a great step forward if, uh, if CMS is able to go in this direction. It aligns the incentives with safety, and at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we're also trying to protect those suffering from mental health and substance abuse. Uh, now, these populations are not discussed as frequently as, as the elderly and individuals with underlying conditions, understandably so. Uh, individuals with mental health and substance abuse issues do have increased stress, pressure, and anxiety caused by this emergency, particularly with the mitigation measures. So this is a topic that my wife, our first lady, has been very involved with, and she's following it closely, um, even as we have a five and a half uh, week old baby. To ensure that the, those individuals can get the help they need, uh, I've asked Secretary Mayhew to lift all Medicaid behavioral health service limits. Florida Medicaid covers an expansive array of services for children and adults, but there are limits in place for most services for adults. Given the effect COVID-19 may have on mental health, behavioral health services, such as ind individual family therapy sessions or access to medications, should not be limited. I've also directed Secretary Mayhew to remove all prior authorizations for behavioral health service. And Medicaid managed care plans up to have up to seven days to render a decision if the, ser if the service is not urgent and two calendar days to respond in urgent situations. But patients in need of mental health should not have to wait to know uh, if they can be treated. So this will also reduce administrative burdens for providers that are having to adjust resources and business practices in response to COVID-19, i.e. increased use of telehealth for service delivery or tele teleworking administrative staff. Jared's going to come up and talk about Division of Emergency Management, but this has, from the time when the emergency started until the present, the state of Florida has sent for healthcare workers, first responders, long-term care facilities, more than 22.5 million masks, nearly 10 million gloves, 1.6 million face shields, a million shoe covers, 450,000 gowns, 200,000 containers of hand sanitizer, 85,000 goggles, and 38,000 coveralls. So it's been a massive logistics operation, really focusing on supporting those frontline healthcare workers. We also now have a uh, machine down in Miami that can clean the PPE, clean the masks so that they can be reused. That's helpful to have, especially it seems like the supply chain 
is starting to work a little bit better than six weeks ago. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is still done in China. The antibody tests we had were sitting in China. But we had a tough time getting them out of China. One of the things we need to do with this whole uh, pandemic is understand all this stuff should be made in the United States, not made in China. We don't want our health destiny to be resting in the hands of a communist dictatorship. So I think you're going to start seeing that. Certainly in Florida, we would welcome any of the manufacturing, uh, masks, any of the PPE, uh, kits, whatever you're doing, come to Florida. We got a good business environment. We would love to have you here. But being able to reuse the PPE is something that's very, very important. We had a five point plan from the very beginning on, on combating COVID-19, obviously protect the elderly and the vulnerable, uh, social distancing, supporting the healthcare workers, expanding testing, and not having the disease be introduced from outside the state of Florida. So to that end, we put a quarantine order in uh, pretty early on for people coming from the New York City area. And to date, uh, we have uh, screened and quarantined 42,321 travelers. Most of that is New York. We did have some from Louisiana when New Orleans was really a hot spot. Fortunately, uh, Louisiana seems to have really turned a corner and we're, we're happy for that. But there have been th almost 3,500 flights uh, between March 23rd and May 4th. Now, a lot of those have few passengers at this point, but still, that's just been something that's been a major challenge when you take that many people from the number one hotspot in the world, plant them into Florida, particularly Southern Florida. Um, so I think that these orders really helped reduce the spread and reduce the introduction of the disease into our communities. We have, um, uh, tomorrow we'll be doing the announcement on the mobile RV lab. We'll also be doing the announcement this week on the antibody testing. Uh, we're also going to be, and I've been talking with uh, Director Moskowitz, uh, we're preparing for hurricane season. Uh, we understand that if this pandemic, we don't know how, this, uh, how the virus is going to react as we move into these various stages. We don't know what it's going to look like a month from now, three months from now, but we have to assume that it's going to be with us in some capacity. So how do you deal with hurricane issues? Jared's been working with FEMA on it. We've got a great uh, ideas. And so that's all gonna have to uh, go into effect. How do you do sheltering? How do you do some of these things which are challenging under normal circumstances, but an added challenge when you're talking about having uh, the introduction of this virus. The one thing that I think we've learned is this virus really thrives and transmit when you have close sustained contact with people inside an enclosed environment. So you look, prisons, there's a lot of, of in the prison, obviously if it gets into a long-term care facility, you look at some of the other public transportation, but the number one venue for transmission, certainly in Florida, and I think probably everywhere, has been inside the home amongst family members because you're in an enclosed environment, you have close repeated contact with people, and that's really what the virus likes in terms of it being transmitted. So as you're looking at sheltering for hurricane, you got to keep that in mind. I mean, if you pile people into a place under normal circumstances, that may be fine, but that would potentially uh, allow the virus to really spread if somebody is in fact infected. So those are very important things. When Jared and I were talking, we've had a number of storms over the last few years. We're due for a break, but we're assuming that we're gonna have more storms and I think you gotta be prepared. I'm gonna let Jared come up and say a few things about Division of Emergency Management, uh, then I'll be happy to, uh, to take some questions. Governor, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the National Guard that's here today. They've been a real partner in helping us get these sites uh, up and running on time uh, and really getting uh, getting them working without many kinks. A lot of other states have had problems with uh, the drive-throughs and, and the National Guard here deserves a lot of credit uh, for, for working through those things so that these things can happen seamlessly. I want to thank our local partners, uh, obviously are the folks in Sarasota County, Manatee County, uh, their emergency management departments, their fire, EMS, uh, police departments, and, and just uh, county staff on, on getting this uh, up and running. This really is a joint uh, site between those two counties and so I really appreciate uh, their efforts and I want to thank the elected officials behind me obviously for you know uh, letting us know where where the need is helping us make sure that you know their community uh, is getting is getting served and so uh, you know this is 
uh, our newest site. We have other sites uh, that are coming online. Uh, the governor will be announcing uh, later this week uh, a site in, in Miami Beach, which we should be opening this week, and then two more, uh, one in Brevard County, uh, one in Volusia County. Uh, and as we see that there is a need uh, for this sort of model, uh, we'll continue to open these sites. Uh, HHS is supposed to be pushing us uh, collection swabs, uh, collection kits over the next couple of weeks. I plan on using those in addition to the ones we've ordered with vendors to increase testing as much as possible. And the governor's talked about that obviously in his, in his phased approach. We're also continuing to talk to labs uh, to increase our lab capacity right now. As the governor's addressed, our capacity to process labs exceeds the demand based on how many collection kits we're sending, based on how many collections we can gather in a day. And so we'll continue uh, to make sure that we're plussing up our labs so that we don't get into an issue as we get more collections because it's a really a two-step process. And so we're signing another deal with another lab today uh, in South Florida so that, that we'll continue uh, that march. Uh, the governor talked about obviously getting to 30, 40,000 labs a day. We're already over uh, 30,000 in that capacity, so we're looking forward to getting uh, to that 40,000 40, number. When we open these sites, we open them up really at a 400 uh, per person capacity, just again to work out the kinks, make sure everything works. Uh, after today, this site will go to 750 a day, uh, just like our other sites. The one in Lee County is also going to go to 750 a day. We're not seeing even in South Florida any site doing 750. They're doing around 500, 600 a day. It goes up and down. Uh, so, but I just wanted to make sure that if people come and get in line and want a test, uh, that they can they can get a test. Uh, so uh, the governor obviously obviously addressed that we're going to get the antibody tests out, not just to hospitals, uh, but to these uh, these drive-throughs. And so we look forward to accomplishing that this week as well, uh, as as well as the mobile uh, lab. And the whole point of the mobile lab really is to get results faster for our long-term care facilities. So these people are going to get swabbed. They're going to get results the same day, uh, and then that thing is going to move from place to place to place. That's the whole point of being mobile. So don't be surprised if for a couple of days it's in South Florida, a couple of days it's it's here in, in Sarasota, Manatee, Tampa, then it goes up to the Panhandle, goes over to Duval. I mean, we are gonna move that thing around to continue to try to get different samples uh, from long-term care facilities and get results uh, as fast as possible. And we'll obviously follow where we might have cases that are popping up. We'll also go to asymptomatic places because we wanna see uh, what's happening uh, in those communities. Uh, we have walk-up sites uh, that are still opening. One more will open up in Riviera Beach and Palm Beach this week, uh, and we'll look forward to opening up more of those uh, in underserved communities. We found some real good partners, uh, FAMU and Leon County, the Urban League in Broward County. So I want to thank all of them because uh, they've really been uh, fantastic uh, to work with. Uh, the governor talked about our PPE efforts. I won't re go over the numbers. Uh, we're at 8 million masks right now for long-term care facilities. Another half a million went out yesterday. Uh, we'll be at 10 million by the end of the week, specifically just to long-term care facilities. Plus, the federal government is sending them two weeks worth uh, of PPE. So uh, there should be no uh, issues with PPE in our long-term care facilities. Uh, if uh, there is a long-term care facility that is still struggling, please contact the Division of Emergency Management. I personally will make sure uh, that, that your needs uh, are, are met. Uh, hurricane season. As we get into hurricane season, one of the most important things that we do, one of the lessons learned uh, from this is to make sure that we have adequate supplies. And so in addition to making sure that we can serve the needs of today, we're making sure obviously that we're creating a stockpile uh, for hurricane season. And so uh, we are buying up PPE and putting it in reserve in our warehouse to make sure that we have 10 million masks on hand as we get into Hurricane season, the governor announced just the other day that we signed a long-term deal with Honeywell in which we're going to get N95 masks right from the manufacturer. We're going to get 12 million of those uh, over the next year. That's a long-term deal. Uh, and so, you know, we're making sure that we will have the resources uh, that we need as we get into hurricane season. FEMA's been a real partner. Uh, figuring out, obviously, how we're going to factor in COVID-19 into hurricane season. We're going to do more non-congregate sheltering instead of mass congregate sheltering. If we have to do mass congregate sheltering, what are the protocols that we're going to put in place? Are we going to have COVID-only uh, shelters? How are we going to do evacuations? Uh, how are we going to limit evacuations? So maybe you have stay-at-home orders for people who live in facilities who are built to a certain hurricane code based on the hurricane that is approaching. And so all of these options are on the table. Uh, we've been talking to all sorts of experts in the field, getting all sorts of different pieces of advice. I talked to Craig Fugate every couple of days. Uh, I talked to uh, former Administrator Brock Long, 
we're talking to all sorts of different people uh, because obviously Florida is going to be the tip of the spear on making sure that states are prepared to deal with COVID-19 uh, and uh, hurricane season. And Governor Sanders has been uh, leading on that effort, making sure that uh, we're going to be ready uh, for whatever happens uh, this hurricane season, whether we might see something early in June or July or whether we might see something typically uh, in the August, uh, September uh, timeframe. Uh, with that, Governor, thank you. Well, thanks, Jared. You've done a really good job. It's uh, very difficult. It's, this logistics is difficult under any circumstances, but the amount of crunch that was happening with this worldwide, we now know China was hoarding a lot of supplies for itself. It, it was challenging, but, but Jared's done a great job, so thank you. And with that, you're up from, is your market cover here? We are today. Okay. So we went through the numbers and what you saw is, I mean, this has required a lot of engineering on the back end. I, I mentioned yesterday, we were in a situation where this thing was just totally shot. So we looked at, can you just get a new one? And the bottom line is that would have taken like a year. It just, it was not viable. Can you figure out a way to just go around the system by hand? But you have to do all these checks to comply with law, so you just couldn't do it. So we've engineered it. Um, there's been, uh, I think, 777,000 of the claims have been processed. Uh, if you look particularly in the last couple of weeks, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of payments um, that, that have gone out. So the last week or two has finally gotten us in a good spot not there yet there's going to be more done on the system over the weekend but what they're doing on the weekends because you've seen some major spikes in payments on these mondays and that's great they actually take the interface down uh, you can still apply on pega or send in the written application but it allows them to make changes uh, because the system has really got flawed architecture and by the way uh, we're, we're doing an IG investigation into this thing was contracted in 2011. It's multiple amendments to this thing. It ended up being $77 million. The engineers I talked to said, look, for that type of money, this thing just didn't fit the bill. So we're going to research that, figure out, investigate, uh, figure out uh, you know, what the problems were. But in the weekend, they do work, but then they're processing all day and all night. And so that, I think, has helped get the numbers up. So we're continuing to work hard. It's obviously not, uh, not, not done, uh, but compared to where it was three or four weeks ago when literally you, you could pay like 1,500 people at a time a day, that's not going to cut it when you have this many people. We also, I mentioned yesterday in the, in the brief, one of the, the part of the bottleneck was not the Florida system either. It was you submit, our system would take it, but then it's got to ping federal databases, which were taking forever to be able to give us answers. And that's required by the law to make sure you have a social security number, some of these things. So we were able to work with Highway Safety, who's got a lot of this information, and they've been able to validate it so much quicker. So a lot of those payments that came out um, over the last two weeks would been probably most of those still bottlenecked uh, with the federal verification. And so that was really good for DEO to work with them to be able to get that. So, so it's ongoing, it's been a top priority, but we've put so much resources into it because we know how important it is to people. Well, we'll get the information. I'll have someone get it, and we're happy to help. Uh, our DEO, what they do is when they have, when they see things, someone maybe in a news article or on even on social media, they are actively researching and figuring out, okay, you know, what's this, is this person caught up? Is there a problem or whatnot? And, and they've been doing that pretty proactively. The, what they have found is that most of those folks have not completed the application, either didn't have a social security number or not eligible because they didn't have a, uh, they didn't have a, a job recently. Uh, but those are things that, that you know, if you get in touch with DEO, we can help. And there are some other forms of relief for people who don't qualify for unemployment compensation. So you're just telling me if someone not here, we can get the information and we're happy to look at it. Absolutely. I wasn't involved in moving, removing anybody. Um, it, it, so we're happy to work. I got Rob right there. So if you, you have her name and information, okay, right there behind you. See, give it and then we'll, we'll, we'll get an answer today.
Well, we, as you know, DEO does more than just this. This is obviously front and center, but they do do things like hurricane relief and things. I just didn't want John Satter to have to be burdened with it. So that's why we've made that decision. John Satter, secretary of DMS, came in and, you know, he really got this moving. He had been helping up before he got the job here with the call centers, the DEO previously, they just didn't get it done. John helped get it done. We've got now huge increase in call center capacity. And then obviously some of the, the, the architectural changes to the site that have allowed some of the stuff to be processed. So I want John focused only on getting people checks. I mean, that has been the number one priority. And I told him, don't take your eye off that ball. Some of these other things the agency does, it's not that they're not important, but those can be handled and you focus on this because of the sense of urgency. Look, I don't get involved in the blame. I mean, my job is to fix problems. So when things present, I've got to figure out a way to fix it. We've worked hard. We've made progress. We've got more progress to make. You know, one of the things I was disappointed in DEO for was when, when this started, we knew there was going to be a crush. You know, I told them, get people. We need more call centers. We need more people. And they're like, well, it's going to take three weeks to train people. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's, it shouldn't be that hard. John came in, we did 24, 48 hours. But DEO told me we don't need as many call centers because you can just direct people to the website. So early in the process, they, I actually said go to the website because they told me that was the way to do it. They did not test it. They did not beta test it. And, um, and I was disappointing. And so obviously we've got new leadership there. But at the end of the day, in government, you know, there are going to be things. There's a lot of contracts that happen, you know, in the past. There's just different things. When the, when the problem presents itself, what can you do? And I think what we've done is we've done an all hands on deck approach. Uh, this was something that potentially we would not have had any checks out in April because the thing was so damaged. Uh, but we've, we've been as resourceful as we can. I've surged 2,000 state employees from other agencies that have nothing to do with unemployment. And we've put them hands on deck. They're helping to process paper applications, taking phone calls. We now have five fully stocked call centers. I went through yesterday in the brief how the calls had been at this level. And then all of a sudden here, they actually are starting to go down a little bit. I think that's because claims have, um, you know, we have seven over 770,000 claims have been processed, been sending out um, a lot of payments. We've got to keep it up. We've got to keep the momentum up. But if we get to the point where, you know, we're able to just as a matter of course, churn out payments uh, every day at, at a good level, you know, then I think people will see and, and they'll know. But people should know there's a lot of work being done on it. Uh, I know many people have finally gotten paid. If you haven't and you're eligible, you know, it's going to happen. Uh, and we're working as hard as we can to get it out soon. So what we did here, and I know it's not, um, not every restaurant can do this, but we looked at the science and said uh, outdoor seating is simply less risky than an indoor environment. I mean, I think that's been proven with how this uh, disease is transmitted. So we allowed outdoor seating with the six feet uh, in between tables. And so a lot of restaurants have been able to take advantage of that. I think they can do that safely. I'm not saying they couldn't do more than 25% safer uh, in a safe way. I think they can, uh, but we looked at kind of what folks were doing and we wanted to just kind of be very measured about it. My task force recommended that they go to 50% immediately. And I understood that 25, heck, even 50, if you close down because of this, probably not gonna open just for that, I get it. But there were a lot of restaurants that have been doing the takeout and the carry out orders. I did, I allowed them to deliver alcohol. I think that's been pretty popular. We're probably gonna keep that going. Maybe we'll have the legislature change, change the law on that. But I think that that's been good. So it was kind of a baby step in terms of let's get in, let's get safe. But what I want people to do is go in, feel safe, understand that you can do it. All the restaurants are gonna be very cognizant about uh, about safety. And I know a lot of the patrons are gonna be cognizant about safety as well. So what you, I think you're seeing the restaurants that have the capacity to do the patio and the outdoors, they're gonna be able to take advantage of that. Yes, there will be limited indoors, but that of course we wanna get back to where we can go um, on full capacity. You actually can 
even with a full restaurant, if people are cognizant about it, you know, you can do this in a way uh, that is safe. But uh, we felt that that was the, the better way. So we may end up in phase two doing it. But I understand the restaurant folks who were not doing takeout, how it is tough to be able to say, I'm just going to do 25, especially if you don't have any outdoor seating. But we're going safe, smart, step by step. We're being consciously judicious on this. And I think that as people go, they get the sea legs under them. People have confidence. You know, I was asked yesterday, you know, would I take my wife and kids out to eat? Would I feel comfortable? Absolutely, I would. I feel 100% comfortable, partially because I know that my kids, fortunately, are in an extremely low risk group. All of our kids are, you know, unless you have a kid has a serious condition. And so that's a great thing. I mean, just imagine the Spanish flu in 1918. I would take out school-age kids like that it take out soldiers so we know that you can go and then obviously my wife and i you know are in are in less risky groups so i have no problem doing it i have no problem abiding by the safety i have no problem keeping uh, the social distance i know the restaurants want to do it um and and i think that that's the way it's going to go and and we we haven't had a lot of time to get out of the house, even apart from this, because we've got a newborn daughter and I've got other two rambunctious kids on top of that. Um, and But we are gonna go and we're gonna go some of the places in, in Tallahassee and, and, and do that because I think that we need all these small business folks, particularly the mom and pop restaurants. Uh, these are really important parts of the community. And um, my view on all this is obviously safety is paramount but we have ingenuity as a people. We have the ability to figure things out and you have a responsibility to get to yes so that people can get back on their feet and, and conduct their businesses. I think what we did with the restaurants is a start. Obviously, we're gonna have to do more. Heck, if we continue to have 2.6% positive test results coming back, and that's going to be very good for us to continue to go. Um, and if you look at that trend, it's really, really been good. You look at the other trends that you see, the syndromatic indicators went up at the end of March, beginning of April, and they've gone down really across the state in terms of hospital admissions for these uh, certain symptoms. That's another good sign. Hospital capacity has been fantastic this whole time. We have PPE. We have all this stuff going in a good direction. So let's just keep doing it. We're gonna have more opportunities to, to get into phase two. And look, quite frankly, there are parts of this state that probably could have started at phase two. I understand that. But I also think that, that we've, we've just gotta be very measured with how we're doing it, instill some confidence, and, and then I think we can get back very quickly. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Let us know. We've got more. So as this stuff evolves, if there's uh, 